Okay, we are in the book of Ruth tonight. This is message number eight that we have preaching, a series going through the book of Ruth. We're going to read verse 8 through verse 16 tonight. Uh, last week we talked about enter Boaz. He enters into the picture for the first time. We find out that he is our kinsman redeemer. He is a, a wonderful, wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of probably the most um, uh, effective, most picturesque uh, types of the Lord Jesus being our kinsman redeemer. And how he loved Ruth the Gentile, how he loves, Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And he wooed us to himself, he, he loved us, and uh, it was, I, I would say, that if you read the scripture here closely, he just saw her in the field, and it was love at first sight, I think. And, and there's something in his heart and her heart, and it's like that when you get in the will of God, and uh, just things fall in place, and that's what's happened here. In verse number 8, we're in chapter 2, verse 8. And he said, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee, and when thou art thirst? Go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger that is a foreigner and a Gentile? Verse 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and are come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in my sight, O Lord, that thou hast considered me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he parched, excuse me, he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Leave, uh, let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let also let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that which she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. We're going to stop right there, and we have been introduced to, to Boaz. We have seen his kind uh, consideration of Ruth. And he says, I have heard, I, I have heard how uh, you have loved your mother-in-law and taken care of your mother-in-law. And her humble and thankful response that when he let her know that she was special, uh, there were other women there, his maidens and others who gleaned, or really who, yeah, they gleaned in the field. Uh, they gleaned around the corners. And uh, But she has been introduced, and now there are going to be further blessings. So I entitled this, the, uh, the Blessings from Boaz. Not only is he our kinsman redeemer, but there's a whole lot of more blessings that are going to come after this. You know, the Charismatics have this thing, they always say, have you received the second blessing? 
by that they mean have you spoken in tongues which is a sign of receiving the Holy Ghost and uh, you could answer them and say yeah I've received the second blessing and the third blessing and the fourth blessing and another thousand blessings after that amen and uh, I'm glad that when I got saved the Holy Ghost immediately moved in I didn't pray for him I didn't ask him I didn't have to beg him to come in uh, he just came, and, and, and he came in fulfillment of the promise when Jesus said, Disciples, I will send my spirit, he shall be in you, and he'll be with you. And so there's going to be a life of blessings for Ruth coming, and uh, she doesn't know all that's going to happen, but she's going to be the great-great-grandmother of the King David, and God is going to put her in the Messianic line. I mean, there. I mean, these blessings know no end. I have been saved 51 years, be 52 years in uh, in June next year, and uh, there has been endless, endless, endless blessings. And I know that because of the grace of God, not of what I am or anything that I have done. I know that there will be blessings that will come, more blessings that will come. And there has no end until uh, the coming into the home and presence of the one who bestowed that first blessing. And so here's Ruth, and she's being blessed already, but she's going to be more blessed when she uh, is able to marry Boaz and move into his home and bear his child. I mean, it's going to be a wonderful day. Thank God for all the blessing. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. We have to, some of those we have to appropriate by faith. They don't just fall on us. Some, some blessings come when we believe God and trust God for them. It's just like answers to prayer. He said, you have not because you ask not. You've got to appropriate the answers to prayer. And he said, and you shall ask prayer. Believing, you shall receive. So there are some conditions of receiving some of those blessings and some of those that will come through answers to prayer. We ought to have faith. We ought to believe him. We ought to ask him. And uh, we ask not because we believe not. That's why we don't ask. We just don't have the faith to believe it's going to come to pass in verse 14 it says and she left the very first thing said he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was suffice and left well she's going back she left the home she left the house uh, she left the dining room wherever that may have been she has been recognized she has been refreshed from the food she has been revived physically in a way and she's been called and she has experienced fellowship with boaz not only did she sit down with the reapers listen not the gleaners she's not sitting over the corner with the gleaners she's sitting with the reapers She's sitting with the main guys who are out there reaping and they, as they cut the corners uh, and leave the corners for the poor people as we read to you at, out of Leviticus, one how God, uh, one of the ways that he provided for four, uh, poor people was that he said, you leave uh, some of that, don't, don't glean the corners, let the poor people come in. But then he said to her this, he said to the, the, to the young men, he said, let her glean, not, not, not just, not just in the corners that are green among the sheaves, not among the barley, that's what they were harvesting, but the sheaves, that stuff that's already been bundled up, tied up. Sometimes I've seen in the Amish fields, hay fields and stuff, uh, they would bundle it up and, and stand it up so the rain wouldn't soak into it. And uh, that's, they called it a shock of corn. And uh, they, they would, put, you know, you'd see a field out there they'd gone through and see all these ever so often. You'd see uh, uh, scattered through the field these shocks of corn or whatever it was uh, standing in the field. But sometimes they may lay them down if they were going to come right behind them and get them up and keep them dry and put them in the barn. And so she's not sitting over with the gleaners. She's sitting with the reapers. She's sitting with that main body, those young men and others who are... Uh, hired to do this. She's the, I mean, listen, if you were just gleaning the field, you didn't get, your only pay was what you picked up. Now she's with the, she's with the reapers. She is going to get double blessings. And so, you know, she has sat down, she has experienced this fellowship, she has sat down and, and she has filled his feet and worshipped him 
And I'm going to say that it's a whole lot easier to work for the Lord after you have worshipped Him, after you have rested and spent time at His table and in His presence. You think about Mary and Martha and how Martha was covered about many things and she was in the kitchen fixing dinner for Jesus, but Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and Mary comes in, or Martha comes in and says, I need help. Don't you get Mary uh, into the kitchen to help me? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art coming about many things, but Mary had chosen the better part. In other words, the best thing is just sit down and worship the Lord. And when you get through worshiping the Lord and spending time in His presence, I'll tell you what you'll do. Then you'll want to go to work. Then you'll want to go fix Him supper. Then uh, you'll want to uh, serve Him in whatever way He wants you to do that. Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Then he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So first of all, come, rest, relax, fellowship. That's what we do a lot of times when we rest. If we're not sleeping, we sit down and talk and fellowship. Maybe it's like in this situation where they're just sitting around the kitchen table. They're resting, they're eating, they're refreshing themselves uh, with the food. You know what the law said? The law said, work six days. And then rest on the Sabbath, the seventh day. But grace says, rest on the first day of the week and then work the last six days of the week. And so it's just the opposite. The law said, you work first, then you get to get to rest. But grace says you can rest. Rest in Christ. Rest in Jesus. Rest in Him. And then the work that you do is a product of that time of fellowship and worship and praise that you have given to the Lord. It must have been hard for her to leave. Think about it. Having received such a welcome, partaken of such a meal. It's like Peter and John and uh, on the mount with the Lord. And they see uh, the Lord there glorified. They see uh, Moses and they see Elijah. And Peter said, let's build three tabernacles. He was saying, hey, let's, let's build a house. That's good stuff, man. We're having camp meeting up here on the mountain. And there's the Lord. And there's the, we got to see uh, Moses. We saw Elijah. And he said, let's just build three houses here. Let's build some tabernacles. Sit down here and stay a while. But we can't stay there. No, there's a little boy down at the foot of the mountain who's demon-possessed that needs to be delivered. There's a Naomi back home that needs uh, food. Uh, there are others. There are souls to be saved. So it's wonderful to come to the house of God or even at a reading your Bible and praying, worshiping the Lord, but there's a time when we have to get into the field and work for the Lord. He goes on in this and telling that there are workers needed in the field, lost souls that need to be saved, wayward children that need to be prayed in, defeated believers, discouraged missionaries. All those things are going on in our world today. Look at verse 15. And the first thing we see are the instructions of Boaz. Ruth has accepted the invitation, which expressed, resulted in her expressing her thankfulness and her, her admiration, if you will, her bowing at his feet, almost in the act of worship. It's a picture of us bowing at the feet of Jesus. And so he, she has accepted that invitation. Come to the house. Don't, don't uh, go with uh, any other field. Stay right here. Come to the house. Sit with the reapers. You don't have to go with just the gleaners. Those, you get to sit with the reapers, and they're going to they're gonna leave stuff not just in the corners. They're going to leave stuff in the middle of the field, and whatever they leave, that's yours. Man, what a, what a picture of the Lord Jesus. Boaz is now going to reward, reward her for her love, for her, uh, her thankfulness, and for her bowing down to him and submitting to him and just being so thankful for to realize, and listen, whatever, what she said here is so, so applicable to us today. Why would you take interest in us who are strangers? We're Gentiles. We had no 
you know, no hold on God. We didn't have any of the promises of God in the Old Testament. We didn't partake of the covenants or anything else. We were just, we were just heathen. We were Gentiles. We were idol worshiping Gentiles is what we were before I was saved. There's things that I worship, but I didn't worship the Lord. But in the grace of God, He came to me. He came to where I was. He came when I was lost and undone and unclean. He began to woo me through the preaching of the Word of God through friendship with other Christians and through others who were witnessing to me. And He pulled me in and drew me into Himself. Thank God for a loving Savior. Thank God for a kinsman redeemer who can identify with us and who's willing to pay the price that we might become His own. And Jesus did that on Calvary. He paid the price of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, all those who were repenting and, and believe on Him will become part of the family of God and get in on that great inheritance of the saints. So while she is greening and working, Boaz is giving these instructions. It's wonderful to work for the Lord. It's better to work with the Lord. We are the object of His attention. And that means that our success is not solely dependent upon us. Our ability to glean how much we can carry, but it is upon His ability to place handfuls of purpose where we are. There are handfuls of purpose. It wasn't just putting them out there because He's having a good day and He sort of likes this girl. It's more than that. He was going to put them out there handfuls of purpose. The purpose was eventually to bring her to Himself, to His home, to be his wife, to be his bride, to bear his children, to have that kind of intimate relationship. And that's what God desires of us. We, if you're saved, that's what the Lord wants with you. And that's why he leaves handfuls of purpose. There are no accidents with God. God has this planned out. God knows where to put people and things and places and events in your life to bring you closer to him. Handfuls of help, handfuls of encouragement, maybe to a missionary or a pastor or a church, handfuls of souls maybe coming to know Christ, handfuls of grace, handfuls of strength, handfuls of blessings. His grace is sufficient. Paul said, I have this thorn in the flesh, but I, His grace will be sufficient. John is exiled to the Isle of Patmos for preaching the Word of God. And after some years, he is released and let God go. And he goes back to the city of Ephesus from which he left. And there he dies a natural death. But his grace was sufficient on, on Patmos. Alone and without any Christian friends or fellowship, he was alone. I don't know how long he was there, but God's grace was sufficient. Did you know what grace is? Grace is anything you need. That's grace. Whatever you need is grace. Paul needed physical comfort and strength to go on. And God said, thy grace, my grace is sufficient for thee. Sometimes grace is, Lord, I need grace to have victory in my life. It'll be strength for victory. It'll be patience in suffering like Paul. It may come as we need saving grace. Yes, we need the grace of God to save us. And a lot of people uh, just sort of stop right there. But grace is anything you need. It will come to you not only because of the grace of God, but grace is anything you can define that you need. And God will give you grace to bear up under, to go through it, to come out better than you went in. The instruction of Boaz and then secondly notice the position of Ruth she is a, a gleaning among the sheaves I brought this out already but she is not just gleaning now she is among the reapers she sit down with the reapers she's going to reap what they have already put together tied up bundled and the Bible says she took that, she beat it out. You know, you we talk about beating the chaff out of the wheat, and and so when you get through with all the stalk and the and the uh, uh, external stuff, the chaff, 
you just have the little barley seeds, which they grind into flour and make bread. And so when she, by the time she gets to Naomi, it's beat out. She's got an apron full of of uh, barley seed that's ready to be crushed and and powdered and baked into bread, made into barley biscuits, whatever they, I mean, they made a lot of things with this. But in verse 15, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. Glean among the sheaves, not the corners, not the leftovers, not the unbundled barley, but in the main field. Let me just mention some things about Ruth and this gleaning. Gleaning, whether you're reaping or gleaning, it requires stooping. It requires getting down, bending over, or squatting down to get the stuff off the ground. To cut it. If it was left there, they would have one of those cycles and uh, or a grain sickle and we would we used to have one had that big long handle on it brother ken if you remember that and big old uh handle down here and you hold it up here and you swipe that thing hope hope it was um hope it was sharp <laughs> if you didn't wear yourself up yeah i <laughs> still use them i'm saying that's what's going on here what's this picture it pictures prayer it pictures getting down on our knees humiliation the absence of pride She's already broken. She's already said, I don't deserve this. Why would you even think upon me being a foreigner, a stranger in this land? Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Here's what he said. I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God says, you know who I'm going to dwell with? Those who have contrite hearts, those who have humbled themselves. God hates pride. Pride goes before a fall. Satan's the very first sin Satan's sin was one of pride I will be like God Isaiah 66 and verse 2 says for all those things which mine hand made and all those things have been saith the Lord but to this man will I look as what he says this man I'm going to look to this man I'm going to give my attention to this man I'm going to keep my eyes on this man even to him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word has such respect for the word of God, the promises of God, the warnings of God, the standards of God of what is right and what is wrong. He said, I will look to him that is poor to contrite spirit and who trembles, who trembles at my word people don't do that anymore the bible says in romans chapter 3 the fear of god they have not the fear of god anymore used to be sinners that come to church and it didn't matter what was going on they'd come in for conviction they'd be holding on to the pew like that trembling at the word of god trembling at the thought of dying and going to hell but now we've seen so much junk tv has ruined us we see a thousand deaths in a week we watch all that stuff and it's hardened our hearts not only to the gospel but to other things, that's why they can abort babies and never even blink an eye. Hearts are wicked. So gleaning requires stooping, squatting, getting down, humility, absence of pride, prayer. And number two, gleaning requires hard work. There's a reason there's so many, um, say, shallow and unlearned Christians and even preachers. He said, uh, Paul said to Timothy, a young preacher, he said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. He said it's a workman. It is work. You remember in I believe, uh, Ecclesiastes when we were preaching through there, uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, much study is a weariness to the flesh. It's hard to study. It's hard to keep your mind concentrated. So many distractions a day. But gleaning requires hard work. You had to cut it. You had to bundle it. You had to beat it out. You had to take it to the threshing floor. Unbundle it. Take one of those, um, the, the, um, 
uh, was a pitchfork like thing and they would throw it up and if the wind was blowing it would blow the chaff away it would separate the chaff and they would beat it throw it up in the air and blow the chaff away so by the time they got through there's just a big pile of barley seed barley kernels that could be ground in the flour and baked into bread but it required hard work but her gleaning was rewarded it was rewarded because of his love I'm not sure she gathered any more than anybody else did. Didn't have anything to do with it. She was faithful. The, the foreman said she got here early in the morning. She's worked all the way up till right now. And so he, she's being rewarded because of his love, because of her relationship to him. She's being rewarded. You like to reward your kids. You like to reward your grandkids. We reward other people, but we can't afford... To reward everybody we come in contact with. We are rewarded. She was rewarded because of the time she spent in fellowship with him. Sitting at the table. Eating. Sitting. Eating with the reapers. Not the gleaners. Not the strangers. Not the foreigners. Not those who, who were so poor that they didn't get paid for it except what they harvested. No, she is spent time with him at the table in fellowship and she is rewarded abundantly and when she gets home in verse 19 where hast thou gleaned today Naomi asked and where wroughtest thou blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee and she showed her mother-in-law uh, with whom she had wrought and said this man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz <laughs> And Naomi says, and unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And she went on to tell him what he said and what she said and what she was instructed to do. And then she goes on to say do what you do whatever you have to do do whatever he says to do because God's in this thing just wasn't you know <laughs> you remember back in chapter 1 it was her hap to light upon the field of Boaz it just happened <laughs> it was directed of God that's why it happened and then there is he said reproach her not Said the young men, reproach her not. You see her down in the middle of the field, not over in the corner, like all the poor folks over there. No, no, no. If she's down in the middle of the field, you reproach her not. You don't say anything to her. You don't rebuke her. You don't run her back to the corners. You don't do anything. I mean, all hindrances are removed. That rebuke is silence. All help is commanded. You do what I'm telling you to do. Leave those she's in the middle of the field. Gleaning in the field. Meditating in the Word of God. That's a picture of that also. Not only just serving the Lord, but gleaning. You know, when you're when you're really doing Bible study, you're trying to glean kernels of truth out of the Bible. And most people don't have the love for Jesus, the love for the Bible that they need to have. It's hard work. It takes concentration. It takes looking up scriptures to this scripture it takes a concordance to look up things back and forth but if you'll do it you'll you'll have you'll have the blessings of god we have his word and we have his spirit and the bible said that it is the holy spirit who moved men to write the word of god so we have the bible the perfect word of god this king james bible is the perfectly preserved word of god there are no errors in this king james bible god said in psalm 12 i will preserve my word throughout every generation and he has preserved it for us today in the king james bible david's prayer in psalm 119 verse 18 here's what david prayed open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You know, that's a good prayer. I prayed it this week more than once. And whenever you open that Bible, you ought to say that prayer. It'll open mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things 
The word wondrous means wonderful, magnificent, marvelous, awesome things out of thy word. Open thou mine eyes, spiritual eyes, that I may behold, that I may understand, comprehend, see these wonderful things out of thy law. All David had was the Old Testament. He said that took meditation. But the New Testament takes meditation. That's why Paul said, Timothy, study, study to show thyself proven to God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to tell you why so many preachers and there's so many cults around because they don't rightly divide the word of God. They read one verse and build a whole doctrine on it instead of reading the whole Bible and putting it all together. And they want to come up usually with something new and fresh and something nobody else ever thought of. I've never preached anything somebody else didn't preach a hundred years ago. Nothing new. Someone said if it's old, it's been told. If it's new, it's not true. And that's exactly right. We're just preaching the old book over and over and over again. And it's still good. I'm glad in 2020 the Bible's still relevant, still still speaks to our hearts, still addresses our situations, whether it's personal church situations, political situations, the world situation, the economy, whatever it is. The Word of God always addresses it and addresses it properly and rightly. And we have the Word of God and we have the Spirit of God. And remember what Jesus said, John chapter uh, 16, he said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he shall guide you into all truth. If our hearts are tender and, and receptive, we open up the book, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And then Holy Ghost, please teach me and lead me into truth. I don't want to believe anything that's not right, anything that's false, anything that might be considered heresy or hurtful to others. I want, to, I want to know the truth. Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said, I am the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were, and all things were made by Him, and was not anything made that was made except He made it. And then He said of that Word, it became flesh, Jesus, and, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He is the Word. He's the living word. This is the written word. And then we have the spirit who teaches us and helps us put it all together. Let's bow for prayer, please.